Shalom. Welcome to the Jewish View. My name is Rabbi Nachman Simon with the Chabad House of Dalmar, and I have a very special guest with us, Mr. Noah Levin. Uh, say hi to everybody and your international audience here. <laughs> that uh, Noah's, uh, I brought him out because uh, looks like a regular American student, and which in a way he is, but he has a very special story to tell us, and that's why I wanted him to share with all our viewers, of course. He was an American uh, student here in, in the Capital District, and then he went up and got up and uh, joined the Israeli army. So, of course, we want to know what motivated him and tell us what life was or was like in the Israeli army. In any case, welcome to the Jewish View, Noah. Thank you so much for having me. It's a real pleasure to be here. All right, so what motivated you to... Because get, pick up, pick yourself up and go not just go to Israel, which is nice. I mean, people go for tourism all the time and birthright, which is a Jewish program for college students. So that happens all the time, and tens of thousands of people, or probably hundreds of thousands, go on visiting. But to uh, to pick yourself up and go into the Israeli army, which you know people don't go to the American army so yeah. much. Yeah, very few people I know do that, and let alone going to uh, another country's army. So tell us your story. Okay. Um, so my entire life, I grew up in a religious household with, uh, with a lot of like, conversation and importance put around the state of Israel. And um, we, I have family that, that lives there. We've done a lot of tourism over there. Growing up, I went to a summer camp that was uh, that influenced me a lot. That like all the time, one of the biggest messages was you should be a religious Jew in Israel. It's not good enough just to be a religious Jew. Jews are meant to be in Israel. Um, so I always had those things ringing in my head. Things I heard from my parents, and things I heard from camp. Um, and then right after I graduated high school, I was planning on going to Binghamton University, and I took a year off and I went to Israel to learn Torah to go to a Jewish school called Yeshiva. Um, and while I was there, I found they had this drafting program there, um, where all these people were coming specifically to my school so that they could draft into the Israeli army. My school gave a lot of support, a lot of help. This has never been a thing. Before I came to the school, it was never a thing that even entered my mind that like maybe this would be an option for me. Um, and I happened to go to Yeshiva the year that COVID hit. How I, long were you there for now? I was, my first year, I was there for six months. All right. And they pushed to go into the army, you're saying? They didn't really push me to go in. They, I just had a lot of friends that went to that school and then carried on after. I had a lot of conversations with them, um, spent a lot of time with those people, saw them coming off of base and walking into school with their uniforms. Um, they felt it was an obligation. I mean, I didn't quite feel it was like an obligation. Like an American surely doesn't feel, I mean, maybe mm -hmm. the people I know or you know, around here. I mean, again, a few people surely do go, but on the other hand, you don't feel, oh, I'm an American, I have a duty to, uh -huh. to serve the army. I mean, I'm sure a lot of people do feel that around the country, but not, not too <laughs> many people I know. Uh -huh. and then, so that's what I'm saying. It's interesting. You're yeah. in Yeshiva and learning Torah studies, but oh, yeah, should, not should, or like you say, it's a uh -huh. nice thing to go into the Israeli army. Well, it, while I was actually there, wasn't I, I, I didn't actually make up my mind about it. It was when I was sent home back to the U.S. because of COVID. Um, I was staying at home in Albany in quarantine. I wasn't able to do anything. The only thing that was going through my mind is, how do I get back to Israel? That's where I was really enjoying myself. That's where my friends were. That's where I felt meaning. Um, and in order to immigrate properly to Israel, one of the major steps is join the army. So I thought, okay, I'll get a non-combat job. I'll sit in the office. It'll be a year and a half. <laughs> Whatever. It'll be good. Again, I'll... you say a year and a half. That's all the terms are. I mean... That's I what mean, the people go on for two, three years. People right? do three, do two, three years. Um, I did something specific called heads there, where um, a lot there are a lot of religious Jews in Israel that have a big um, that always that have that big value with them to learn Torah. Um, they want to spend time both learning Torah in yeshiva and they want to be in the army. So the army lets them off a little bit, um, lets them have a shorter army service as long as they can tell, as long as they can say, I will definitely be in yeshiva for this many years. It's like signing on a, a degree in, in Torah study, essentially. So you, after you're done with the, so about your service, you have to go back to Yeshiva? Yes. Part of the um, obligation? Yes, they have two years before and two years after, a year and a half of the army in the middle. 
And how much while they're in the Army, how, how many hours do they spend? A few hours or half a day? Or? While you're actually in the Army, how much Torah study goes on? Yeah. It really depends on the unit and depends on the person. The Army's, Army's a hard place to really be motivated towards other things they're passionate about. Sometimes people that don't have like a busy schedule and they feel very motivated, they're able to put in like half an hour, an hour, something like that. But you know, in a combat <laughs> unit, you're somewhere else for a yeah. week or something like that, maneuvers. Yeah. You're not going to be able to just, okay, I'm taking off for a half a yeah, day. So I understand this interesting. All right, so keep rolling. Um, where was I? You were oh. talking about your service, though. Yeah. You didn't go. You didn't do the Hester, though. <laughs> I did do Hester. Oh, you do? I just oh. finished my fourth year in yeshiva. Fourth oh, year. I, I, uh, third year of yeshiva, one, first year after I finished the army. Um, you have to go back because you said you have to do two years? Or? Me, personally, I don't actually have to do two years because I'm a new citizen over there. Um, but most of my friends that do this process, they do have to do two extra. They do have to do two years after the army. Oh, very good. So you did learn all the Hester. Yeah. Was it in a combat unit? I mean, did you get your office job? Or? I did not get my office job. I went there and I started realizing that the religious Jews end up in the combat units. Um, and the important value to me is to be surrounded they by all are. Jews. What are you saying? The religious Jews all are in the combat? Not all, no, but, but most are? With, within Hezder, there's something called the Machleket Benish. Benish is Ben Yeshiva, someone that comes out of uh, Yeshiva Jewish school. And they put everyone from one school together in one unit. Like, imagine, like, a class field trip for a year and a half in the Army. Like, yeah. uh, you, you get sent to the Army with all your friends. So, Very nice. All right. So I wanted to do that. I wanted to be where my friends were going. And I guess it's a little bit of a silly reason to go into a combat unit in the Army. But that's, based, that's mostly what motivated me to go there. Um, so I was put in a unit called Masayat Shirion, which was an infantry unit within the tanks form. They used to take other infantry units from around the army whenever the tanks needed assistance, they would pull them in and it just became a logistical mess. So they made their own independent infantry unit that's just assigned mainly, just mainly to the tanks. Um, so I was in that unit, so I was trained. In a tank battle, I mean inside of a tank? Not inside a tank, alongside a tank. Um, we did, we, I, I think I've never been in any kind of battle, I've never done anything. I had a very, very boring army service. <laughs> Uh, we're looking for boring army services. Um, we were. They always say in tanks. I mean, you were in a tank. They always say that. Uh, maybe it's from World War II. May I read it? Maybe it's better now, but maybe it's air conditioned or something. Yeah. It's just very cramped and it's very difficult uh -huh. to be in a tank and walking around in you know, very cramped surroundings. Yeah. Um, that's why I've heard a lot also. The fact of the matter is I've never been inside of a tank before. Oh, really? I wasn't, no, uh, I wasn't a it. tank soldier. I was an infantry soldier that walked alongside the tanks. Um, my job was mainly to go out ahead of them and scout out the field. I did this all in training. I've never done it in real life. Um, and then there were other people in my unit that were assigned to mortars. And they would shoot mortars if need be within war. Um, so there's always needs to around the tank. They always say they had a, a ship also, they need yeah. always support system. You can't just go out or mm -hmm. they get ruined. So. Yeah, you need so a lot of support. support. 100%. Um, my unit was actually recently closed down and replaced with a different unit. My unit started right after one war. They, after one war finished in Israel, they said, like, they saw this need for this unit to exist. And before anything else has erupted, they closed down the unit already. Mm. Um, so there's there's another like higher end unit, better soldiers trained a little bit better than we were um, that have to do a similar job right now. Um, I know they have drones, they have all kinds yeah. of other cool things. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I just say uh, tell us about the service because I just heard again you're you're the yeah I brought you here to you have first first hand experience and yeah. I surely don't. But they always said that even Israeli, you know, the hardest thing in America is the Marine Corps. Uh -huh. Like, that's really tough. And they say a regular Israeli army is like the American Marine Corps. Did you find it terrible? I mean, I. How many months was it, basic training? Basic training was four months. Well, that's a lot. And then there was four months of advanced training after that. Um, all of this was all the way down the desert. I don't know how many of you know Israeli geography, but. Um, I don't know, all the way down the desert, the bottom of Israel, it gets super hot down there well, all year desert, round. you would assume yeah. the desert is, yeah. All year round, you're essentially in Egypt down there. Um, 
in the summer, which was when I was doing basic training, it was it was an absolute oven outside. There were times of the day that we were allowed to be training, times of the day that we weren't allowed to be training. Because it was so hot out. Because it was so hot outside. Um, I I had a very grueling time out there. By the end of the day, I can I really felt a lot that they had. The things they taught us were all based around very strong morals of doing good in the world. And one of the first days in the army. They gave us a little sheet of paper, or a little like laminated sheet of paper that they told all of us to keep in our pocket all the time. It said Ruach Tzahal on it, like the spirit of the army, spirit of the Israeli army. Um, and one of the main things in there is always putting like the value of like of human life first and making sure to respect each other um, and how all these kinds of values don't just go towards other people in the army, but reflect also towards enemies reflect towards people that that may hate you it just it goes to all mankind um, and at every at every stage of our training they would always bring those values back up um, so like it's interesting yeah I actually you know again so many Israelis have gone to the army and so mm -hmm. many Israeli you're yeah. going to Israel but it goes the other way also so many Israelis really come to America to live. Yeah. And they come into Delmar where we live, and he says first thing in officer's training was just uh, like just clean. It comes out I don't know if it comes out <laughs> clean ammunition. You yeah. know, you just don't go around shooting. I mean, obviously yeah. you have a machine gun, and mm -hmm. you go around shooting everybody. And and obviously there are instigators. Machine guns are illegal in Israel. You can't. You have machine guns. There's no rapid fire. It's only single well, bullets. What even in the army? Even in the army. I never knew that. That's yeah. interesting. Because the American army is not that way. Ameri I think just That's about every true. other army in the world has automatic. Yeah. The Israeli army, we... Well, I didn't know that. It's interesting. We... It gets down to our values of human life. It's about precision. We're yeah, not... Precision. We're not here to spray a crowd. If you're in a battlefield, I yeah. mean, it comes in handy, I would assume. Again, I... Mm -hmm. Just from the movies over yeah. there, you're saying World War II spraying, you know, the enemy. I didn't really do that. That's interesting. Again, showing the higher moral and ethics of... Surely the Jews in Israeli armies are always looking for peace also. Yes. So that would be an interesting idea. And um, there's people, I mean, in Israel, they don't like going to the army. That's what people say. <laughs> I mean, you know, go to, you, you go out of your way, obviously, uh -huh. an American student to go to Israel. And then there's some Israelis who just, you know, interferes with the university. Obviously, yeah. this is a prime time to uh -huh. go to college, 18, 19 years old. And... You know, you're taking off two years, mm -hmm. and like say so going to the army. But I guess you have to have that spirit of yeah. A lot of people thought I was crazy out there for doing it. It's what Israel? Where yeah, people, Israelis, Israelis, Israelis thought I was there. They would, I would get there. They'd be like, "Why would you leave New York? Yeah, come over here." They would tell me like, "You don't know the amount of money I would pay right now to get the heck out of here, out of the desert, and get over to New York." It's a mandatory draft over there. People have their feelings yeah. about it if they're coming from a motivated point of view then it's great. And if they're not motivated, then it sucks. It's, it's just yeah. a thing that's required out there. Um, but what was different for me over there is I was considered a lone soldier. So I had a lot of special benefits went along with my army service also. They recognized, like, because Israel has a mandatory draft, right. um, everyone, y y how do I say this? Everyone's required to go, and they try like make it a little bit less intense than other armies out there. You don't go there for a year at a time and don't see your family the entire year. Every couple of weeks, sometimes every single week, sometimes multiple times in a week, depending on the unit you're in, you go home. And the army pays for your transportation to get all the way home. You get free public transportation all across the country. Uh, but when you're a lone soldier in Israel without a family, which you would, be. which I was, was yeah. then I don't have that. I don't have that whatsoever. Yeah, you base? Who do I? Family, where yeah. do I go to? Um, so my yeshiva took me in. We had a program called Lev L'Chayel, um, where at my school, everyone that wanted to draft, they, they were moved into an apartment in a town called Ramat Beit Shemesh um, with all their friends that they drafted with. Every week they would fill up our fridge. Um, the, army would, you know, the army would give us a lot of extra pay so that we'd be able to sustain ourselves out there. Um, and also just around the country, people really recognize this is a person who's motivated and really likes Israel. So it was a really good feeling walking around and knowing I am a lone soldier. I am someone who really put my life off to the side in order to really reflect the values that I hold. Um, I forgot where I'm going with this. But well, <laughs> just saying, well, I'm just saying how difficult it was to be in a 
soldier. Yeah. Now, actually, uh, just these are issues that had come up with me. You know, I, I talked to everybody and all the Jews. Mm -hmm. And I know one family who was thinking of going in Aliyah, which means going uh, to emigrating to Israel. Uh -huh. On the other hand, they had a son and say, oh, the mother said to me, I'm not letting him go to no army. I don't <laughs> want him getting killed. And because you, know, uh, you always hear the the wars, or yeah, yeah, you know, there is let's say some flare-ups every yeah. almost ten years or whatever. So it's not the safest thing in the world. No, it's not. But um, so but on the other hand, I mean, you know, again, it's not my children. They didn't choose <laughs> to go to Israel. But I mean, you know, not too many wars. I mean, not, you don't know, like you say you were safe. Yeah. It's not like the most dangerous thing in the world. Uh -huh. I mean, it's a little dangerous. I mean, you can say that yeah. for the American Army also. They're not just around killing yeah. people. I mean, I guess when there's Iraqi war, but that was in 1990. It was yeah. over 30 years ago. And so it's not the most dangerous thing that you could do. Well, I hear everyone saying is that everyone's Army service is different. Just because you go to one place in the Army doesn't necessarily mean that your Army service is going to be any less or more intense than someone else. Um, and that also, that depends on the time that you draft and it just whatever your unit is assigned to or whatever just happens to happen to your unit. Um, so there are some people that they draft and it's incredibly safe. It's a day job. You're like in the center of Tel Aviv working right next to the mall in the high rise and you're just showing up to work in uniform every day. And then there are some people that they're doing like very dangerous and serious arrests or they're going internationally to do like top secret missions. Or there are also people in the middle, like me, where I would stand in dangerous places, but nothing ever happened to me. Um, there, are some, there are serious things that happened. A couple of days back, there were three soldiers on the Egyptian border that um, a couple of Egyptian police officers shot them straight across the fence. That's the place they were standing is typically a place that's very, very safe. Thank God we've got peace with the Egyptians. There's, it's all good on the Egyptian border right now. And everyone always says, like, we'll put this lesser, we'll put this less experienced unit down by that border, because why do we need anyone over there? And stuff happens. Um, yeah, there's always something that can happen. There's there. always something that can happen. Um, but it can be very safe. It can be very unsafe. It, it's just yeah, luck. No, no. <laughs> yeah, well, you always hope for no war, but... Yeah. And then, I mean, again, forever, I mean, I think the, in the American Army, a few soldiers told me that, that they've returned, they say they're really always on call, ultimately, yeah. I mean, if there's a real war, yeah. we thank God there isn't, you know, then, mm -hmm. you know, hey, you have the experience, come on back, even mm -hmm. though it's 10 years later. Is that the way, I mean, you're going, what's your future plans, I should say, are, are you going back to Israel? And uh, My future plans time? are going back to Israel. I'm in America for the summer. I got a job over here. Um, I'm going to college in August in Israel. Um, and are you saying, like, am I always in the Army now? now well, that that's what I'm saying, if anything, God forbid. If but, you know, listen, you have to always, um, you know, be aware, you know, they're going to say, hey, yeah. we, we call up. You're in the reserves, yeah. or do you have to do um, the reserves, for example? I don't actually know yet if I'm in reserves. Most people are in reserves. Um, because I'm in, because I, I was a lone soldier and because I was, um, I'm a new citizen, there's a chance that I might not be in reserves. More likely than not, I will be. Um, I'll probably find that out at the end of the summer. Right. Um, so if I am in reserves, that means that if there is a very big war, they could call me up. Or um, a lot of times, even if there isn't a war, they're just... Uh, they need a lot of like assistance with uh, the gaps in, in the chart for where everyone is surrounding the country, where people are located, where people are based. So they might call me up for a week or two to guard a specific post somewhere. And in the meantime, I'll tell them how much I make at whatever job I'm at, or if I'm in college or unemployed, then whatever sucks, they won't pay me anything. Yeah. Um, and that's what's going to be. So, you know, yeah, there's always that possibility. Again, you know, again, you know, we were talking about, you know, it could be a tough job. I know an Israeli couple that did come back, to, you know, they did not come back, they were Israelis, they came to America. Uh -huh. So I says, well, we do an army. He says he was, he um, detonated mines. So he uh -huh. says, well, this is crazy. One, you know, one mistake and you, you're done. You know, yeah, something, all right, a mistake is something happens, mm -hmm. all right. So, you know, he was scared. So, again, you know, it's... Uh, I have friends that were in that unit. I have really? friends that were in that unit. Um, yeah. They deal with explosives. Yeah. The joke is they salute like this. They're missing a couple of fingers yeah. from explosions. <laughs> it's not... 
and, uh, stuff like that doesn't happen. People don't lose limbs anymore to stuff like that anymore. That was back like, yeah. like all the way beginning of the country. Well, it could be again. You know, <laughs> these are dangerous situations. Like you say, there's easier jobs and, and yeah. more difficult jobs. By just saying, you know, when you go into the army, it's not an easy thing. And mm -hmm. really, uh, kudos to you. I mean, that you felt that. Uh, did you have an option of not going to be an Israeli and not going to the army? Or once they said, hey, I'm going to Aliyah, I want to mm -hmm. be here. Well, if you're here and you want to be a citizen, that means you're going to go into the army. If I wanted to get my citizenship right now, I wouldn't have had the option unless I wasn't medically fit or psychologically fit. Um, I could have, if I really wanted to, I could have made up some kind of like psychological thing and said that I'm not ready for it. Um, but if I didn't want to get citizenship, I could have waited till I was, I think the number is 28. I could just live in Israel on a visa until I'm 28 and get my citizenship then. Or if you're I'm too old to go into the army. Yeah, then, then at that point you're too old to get drafted. Um, or you can get married and have a kid if you're feeling, if you're feeling inspired. They wouldn't, they wouldn't draft you either. <laughs> no, it wouldn't draft you either if, you, if you're married and have a kid. Um, but you got to really, really commit to... You gotta really, really commit to whatever you're doing. You can't just uh, you can't just do that because you're getting out of the army. Um, you gotta have other motives for doing that. Um, if I wanted to, I unless I really wanted to beat around the bush, I wouldn't have had the option. I would have had the option of what you and I would have gone to. I could have gone to non-combat. I could have gone to a different combat unit. I could have tried out for uh, like for a more intense unit if I wanted to. Um, you know, on the other hand, that, you know, again, I mean, these are the things that people talk to me about, and I talk into a lot of Israelis, and they say, well, the Orthodox Jews, they uh -huh. don't go into the army. Well, of course, you say you're an Orthodox Jew, and that's why you're here, to show uh -huh. the people that, listen, I'm, you're Orthodox, and I just, you know, just don't ban Israel, mm -hmm. you know, and they have nothing to do with them. You obviously are going to be a good Israel citizen while uh -huh. you went to the army. That's pretty good. But um, there are a lot of Orthodox Jews just saying, hey, I'm Orthodox, uh -huh. leave me alone, and, mm -hmm. and that would be a good excuse, or I don't know, would they, would um, they be able that, to say that? That does work, but you have to sign, you have to say, I'm going to like live my life learning Torah. You have to, you have to get what's called a pator, saying that you're too religious for it. Um, there are certain religious Jews that do get a pator for going, that, do, that are able to get out of it, but when you're part of Hezer, it's almost a compromise for what they're saying. At the beginning of the country, people are saying, as Jews in the country, we need people that are both, um, that are both out there fighting um, or to get like the, the physical work done. And then we also need people that are saying, they're staying behind and learning Torah so that we get the help from God and they're able to keep Jewish values alive in the country. Um, and people in Hezder, they made the compromise where there were the people at home that were, that were learning Torah, the people in Yeshiva that were learning Torah, and the people in the army um, and they said, we want to combine the two of them. We want, we want to be learning Torah, we also want to be serving the country. So this is a newer, I mean, obviously Israel, if people don't know, is 75 years old. Yes. And so this was a newer, so to speak, kind of innovation. I don't actually know when Hezer was started. Um, I, don't, I know that it wasn't in one of the first years of the country. It might have been five or ten years in. So it gave a little bit of compromise. You want to yeah. learn and be a good Jewish person. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But sometimes it's difficult. I mean, they mm -hmm. they always have these stories, and even the American Army, you know, I I put the filling on, the phylacteries on every day, even though mm -hmm. I was in the American Army, which is a lot harder, harder uh -huh. to keep Shabbos. Oh, it's Saturday. Okay, I'm taking off. Mm -hmm. I mean, how did they deal with Saturday there? In the did Army? They, yeah, did they let you off? Say, okay, day of rest. Uh-huh. Um, in the army, Saturdays are usually, if there's nothing going on for you, it's an off day, like a time you go home, um, either see your family or go to wherever, uh, whatever respective places you live. I, I lived in my yeshiva. Or when you're on base, there's no work that's done except for the things that, that are what's called surah chivtsait, like the, the real military needs, the things that are, that are required for the country's safety. Um, so if you just have your regular day job, if you're on base, then you're just on base and you're hanging out. And there's food available for you and there's nothing required of you. But if you're a combat soldier and there's posts that need to be guarded, yeah. then you do all of those things that are required for the safety of the country and everything else, um, you're, it, you're not just not supposed to do. You're required by military law not to be doing those things on base. 
Yeah, it's good because I think, well, you tell me if I'm wrong, but, you know, I hear, I mean, they have jets, you know, they're always spying out yeah. and, and you know, the, the rabbis themselves, it wasn't against Jewish laws. Well, yeah. protection is something that's needed. You can't yeah. just sit around and if the enemy knows, oh, everybody just sitting around doing nothing uh -huh. on Saturday, well, it's almost the Yom Kippur War. That was their logic of the... The mm -hmm. enemy saying, hey, we know everybody's fasting, they're in synagogue, and uh -huh. they let their guard down. Well, it's a good time to attack. So the, even the rabbis do allow that. The rabbis know, do allow Just that. again, you meet up with Chabad, with the Chabad <laughs> unit, and you know, a little bit different philosophy than you're saying. I know a lot of religious, I'm talking about Orthodox Jews, saying to be an Orthodox Jew, you should be living in Israel. Mm -hmm. The Chabad idea is just... Be surely do the turn of the missus and be religious, but wherever you are, America, the mm -hmm. Hong Kong, you know, all over the world, just do the mitzvahs. But on the other hand, that um, they do interact. Some people say, oh, you have nothing to do with, the, mm -hmm. you know, Israeli society, which is not true. I know one person, he was, this is a story I heard from his sister, who was an Orthodox Jew, and he was some, like you say, in some... <laughs> I'd say in Yiddish, Gavorf in an outpost somewhere in uh -huh. another, and it was Purim, and he felt bad because he didn't have the Megillah. He, uh -huh. he has to be on an outpost on Purim. He wants to hear the scroll of the Megillah. And a, a few Chabad guys came to his unit, again, out uh -huh. in the middle of boondocks, like I say, middle of nowhere, and they said, well, you know, we'll read the Megillah. So Jesus, from now on, I like Chabad, because, you know, they went out of their way Amazing. to help... Uh, you know, uh, to help the soldiers. Obviously, it's important for them, for for these students, the yeshiva students, and they took their time out to be helpful to another. I actually had other st soldiers. I, I had quite a few interactions with Chabad in the army. Uh, my two big, my my biggest ones were a on on the Chagim. Chabad would always show up on the Hanukkah. Chabad pulled up with the the van with music and gave everyone donuts. They drove around base. They gave doesn't doesn't matter who you were. They were like. Jews, Christians, Arabs, all kinds of people. There aren't just Jews in the Israeli army. Thank God, we've got a lot of we got a lot of people, different religions. We all want to serve Israel. Um, they would show up. They wouldn't ask any questions. They just give people donuts and make people happy. On Purim, they did the same thing. Um, the first base that I was at in the army, a base called Shizafon, a really, really big base down south. Um, the rabbi of the base was a Chabad shaliach. Really, but he got his uh, his shibutz. How do you say that? He got his assignment. For, for shluchas, for where to be a rabbi, at this army base. Um, so there were Tanya Shirim, I forgot the Rav's name, there were Tanya Shirim on base. I wasn't always able to get to them when I was on base, I would try to get to them. Um, and it was, it was truly incredible seeing, you seeing how far Chabad can reach out and really help people. Um, yeah. I thought that was great. I also had a Chabad Nick in my unit who drafted with me. He really? said it was his it was his shluchis to go to the army. He just he decided it was his shluchis, but he read he read Megillah for my unit. Um, he was just always around bringing Divrei Torah, speaking about Torah with people, speaking about Hashem, speaking about God. Um, it was great having him around. Excellent. I know <laughs> that story where a person was irreligious in the army and he turned on to it came to America to be religious, really? but he remembers he was in the Lebanese War. Oh, so okay. now it's in the, it's he's at the front. He was a captain. He says I'm at the front. And all of a sudden he says that there were soldiers dying, still didn't even get picked up yet. Uh -huh. We're really at the front lines. And he says that there's this white fan. He says, white, are you crazy <laughs> over here? You know, everything's camouflaged. <laughs> you know, a white thing in the middle of a forest in the woods or something. So any, any enemy could see it. It stands out. He says, Chabad guys driving along and high and putting <laughs> on the music. He says, you're crazy. He says, I am there to protect my unit. But he says... You know, they went out of their way, and that's really something to be on the front lines, but just, again, making everybody happy because, uh -huh. again, you can only imagine, and I can't, but, you know, what it means to be on a battlefront and being shot at, number uh -huh. one, seeing your fellow friends being uh, hurt or killed altogether, so it surely isn't a pleasant experience, to say the least. Uh -huh. And um, in any case, you know, Chabad was there again, you know, just... That's when you need an uplifting spirit, and Chabad was there, and it turned him on enough where he just saw that, is you know that there's something special about being religious and they're bringing being dedicated. Uh, they're bringing a special kind of protection. You don't always you don't always recognize that that's the right thing in the moment. 
when you're in a, when you're in a battlefield or about to enter a battlefield, you might think that you have it all set in the right way that you're you're all uh, you're all ready for it. But sometimes sometimes you really need the sometimes you really need the simcha. You really need the happiness. Well, that's you know we always <laughs> say that. Well, no, it's very important because I even bring out you know when the the Rebbe does tell us you know do it with music. What's with mm -hmm. music? We're musicians or your rabbis? But I just say uh, actually I just uh, give an example for the army. Mm -hmm. Like, uh, there's an army band. What's a band? Your musicians or your soldiers over uh -huh. here? What do you have a band for? You always have bands. But again, you go out with a song, uh -huh. and uh, it gives you the, 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 more, uh, the moral spirit mm -hmm. and the higher spirit, because that's what they say, and even now with the Ukrainian and the mm -hmm. Russian, uh, you know, if you're down and out, oh, we're losing, and uh -huh. what's the use? Well, you're not going to fight so well. Again, it is a sports example also, mm -hmm. if you're down and... You know, you have them cheering, come on, you guys, let's go, let's go. Then you're going to do a better job. So spirit is, like you say, it's one of the hidden things. You know, you can't, you know, say how many tanks you have, how many planes you have, uh -huh. that you can count. You're not going to count the spirit, but that spirit is it's sometimes even more important. I mean, with Israel, they don't have the number of tanks and planes no, against all these Arabs. So and it's, again, you're fighting for your homeland and you're fighting for... You know, like you say, if you're religious, then you know this is your promised land and this is the homeland. Mm -hmm. It's not just, all right, Texas, not Texas. Mm -hmm. so you live in uh, Ohio instead of Texas. But, you know, uh, but you're actually fighting for your homeland. So, no, it is very interesting, and I, and I found it very interesting. Well. And I um, uh, hope our viewers also found it interesting. We'll call it the American soldier and the <laughs> American student and the Israeli army. So That's thank great. you very much for being thank on the Jewish View and, and uh, sharing your story with us. Thank you.